talked about his trip last spring, uh, summer. or summer, June, uh, to uh, the Philippines. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you all for coming on a beautiful day. I, I was uh, talking about this when, when uh, we're, I was setting up the computer, I was, I was wondering if, if anybody was going to uh, be able to break away from the sunshine. So I appreciate everyone coming here tonight and, and listening to um, listening to, the, to my, my presentation. So um, uh, so the title of the talk, you know, I've kind of got this long title here, but um, you know, but basically the the, um, the 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 short goal of the project is really the conservation of the Philippine eagle and. Um, and part of the, the, the goal for how to accomplish that is through um, uh, community-based forest conservation and, and planning. And it, it was really interesting when I got um, asked if I was interested in helping this, with this project, <coughs> I, I, I recognized there was a few parallels between, even though you know, the Philippines is like on the other side of um, the world and you know, it's very different environment. There was a, a few parallels that were described to me between the kind of the Cordoba community and the community where we were going to and that, you know, that a lot of the communities there depended on their forests for food and resources, just like we depend on our forest here for, you know, getting food from and getting our firewood from. You know, it's a, it's the same s similar basic human needs of, of uh, you know, getting resources from the national forest. Um, and so, just to kind of start, Milo kind of described this, but um, hopefully this isn't too much of a bureaucratic slide, but uh, I wanted to put this in here because, you know, the, the Forest Service is a, is a really big organization. There's like 33,000 employees in the agency nationally. And the uh, national forest system, which is where you know I work or Milo works, um, it, where we manage the national forest is is kind of one branch of the Forest Service, and um, and there's several other types of branches. We have an international programs branch, we have a state and private forestry branch where they provide support to to states uh, and private landowners. There's a research and development. We work with researchers quite often here in Cordova. Um, that come up out of um, Corvallis and other research stations. Um, they're more of the scientist types. Um, and then uh, um, for on the national forest side, oops, uh, on the national forest side, you know, we, I work uh, to help manage um, part of the Chugach National Forest, as you know, that surrounds the community of Cordova here. Um, but on the international, for the international program side, they do work all, really, all around the world um, and um, all, all sorts of places, you know, um, we, they do work in Latin America and Canada. Um, another, um, I'm sure everyone has had an opportunity to meet Erin Cooper. She's also had an opportunity to work with our international programs. Um, on our Copper River Migratory Bird Initiative, um, working with birds all across the flyway from South America and, and uh, Southern North America all the way up through Canada and into Alaska. And then, you know, there's also programs that uh, the Forest Service does in Russia and Europe, like when I went to, uh, in the kind of Eurasia and Asia, that's like when I, for example, when I went to help with uh, um, crane project in, in Mongolia, Africa, and then um, also Asia and the Pacific Islands. And <clears throat> so, you know, in kind of a, um, more specific terms, these are some of the goals of the Forest Service International Program. And, you know, I'm just going to kind of highlight these, but, uh, you know, it's part of the goal is to, um, is to improve people's lives across the country. Um, by sharing expertise, like if the, the Forest Service has a lot of knowledge of how to manage natural resources and, um, and also sometimes uh, with disaster assistance or if there's uh, wildfires. I know that we've sent, uh, occasionally we'll send staff to 
a country if they have a really big wildfire because the Forest Service has a large firefighting staff. Um, um, some of the projects I've been to, we've sent specialists that are either hydrologists or range conservationists or different, sometimes they're biologists or sometimes they might be foresters. Um, a whole kind of variety of resource specialists that work for the Forest Service that um, will go and work with other countries to um, help them with some issues. And then also to share technology and um, and also quite, it's also a good opportunity for folks like myself, for Forest Service employees to gain some experience working with, um, with uh, partners. And in some collaborations like the work that um, Aaron Cooper's doing, sometimes it helps with like life cycle conservation. Like if we have birds that are, you know, breeding in, you know, Alaska or the Arctic and wintering down in um, southern parts, you know, unless you're working on conservation on a, on a flyway scale or a global scale, sometimes it's hard to meet those goals. Um, and so some of the kind of topics for international programs might be illegal logging or wildlife trafficking, um, forest governance or forest management, climate change, um, habitat management, migratory species. That's one that I've done quite a bit with. Um, before I came to Cordova, I helped a lot with uh, migratory bird conservation. Like I mentioned fire management. Um, disaster management and land use planning. That's another one um, that we have a lot of experience with. You know, we're always in the process of constantly planning how to manage the national forest. Uh, right now, Milo is helping us with our new forest plan, and um, um, and that's part of what we went down. What I went down to help with the with the project in the Philippines. Level. So I just wanted to kind of set that context for the international program. And specifically, the work that uh, we're doing in the Philippines, um, the, for, the U.S. Agency for International Development is um, kind of the a funding mechanism that the Forest Service helps use to help promote some of these types of um, opportunities in different countries. And, um, some of the stuff that, that they've been working on, I've got these projects specifically identified here, but um, it's supporting Philippine forest management, assisting um, the, the, the Department of Natural Resources um, in the Philippines with forest monitoring and management is one of the kind of broad goals, basically sharing our knowledge of forest management with, um, with their resource specialists um, also helping with uh, civil defense. You know, the Forest Service has, right now we've got staff from this office that are working on fire, wildfires in, in, um, in Montana. And we just sent uh, Andy Morris, our law enforcement officer, we just sent him to uh, Puerto Rico to help with um, disaster management. And when we had the oil spill here, you know, a lot of the Forest Service kind of expertise for like um, incident command um, management of an incident is what was utilized when the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened. So kind of sharing that type of response knowledge is another thing that's been actively happening in the Philippines that the Forest Service has been um, promoting. And we send down some of our kind of uh, incident response uh, expert staff to help with that. And then the one project that I've been working on is, uh, or that I was helping, is kind of this partnership with the Philippine Eagle Foundation. And, um, and they're working to help conserve um, eagle habitat and the conservation of the Philippine eagle. Um, and that's, that's what the topic of my talk is today. Um, so first I want to just kind of tell you a little bit about the Philippine eagle. So the Philippine eagle, um, it, it, it used to be called the monkey-eating eagle, but um, they, uh, they renamed it as the Philippine eagle because it's the national bird of the Philippines, and it's a, uh, um, it's a gigantic forest eagle. Milo kind of uh, mentioned the harpy eagle when, uh, when, you know, and it's very similar if you're familiar with the harpy eagle, the giant harpy eagle of the South American jungle. This, 
this bird is, is very similar in that it's um, uh, I think it's maybe the largest eagle in the world and it's critically it's a critically endangered species um, uh, and there's only you know when there used to be a, a lot of uh, tropical forest hey there used to be a lot of tropical forest for them to, to nest in and live in and um, now because of a lot of factors the population has um, has really um, uh, gone down quite low. It's very critically endangered. I think there's only a couple hundred of the birds left that they're aware of. Um, so uh, this is just a few more facts about it. You know, it's got a wingspan of two meters or about six feet. Um, it's got a height of about one meter. Um, the uh, you know one thing that's that's kind of critical. Is they they lay a single egg every couple of years, so they've got a real slow reproduction rate, you know. Um, so that means that they're investing a lot into that individual chick, and if something happens to that chick, it uh, you know it's 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 not good. It's not like um, say uh, um, other birds that might have six eggs in the nest and they nest every year. These birds <coughs> will lay a single egg, and then they'll they'll train that chick and raise that chick over the course of this says um, two years, but um, it, sometimes it's actually a little bit longer than that. Um, I uh, I'm actually going to take a, a little break from this slideshow. I'm going to come back to this slide. I just wanted to um, uh, orient folks a little bit to. Uh, to where where we're at, so um, so obviously you know we're up here in um, Alaska, and the Philippines is is over here, and um, where I was when I went on this trip, um, um, so the Philippines is a a whole series of uh, many islands, um, and the uh, the capital of Manila is kind of on the northern island, uh, Luzon Island, which is this largest northernmost island. Um, and just a, a little bit of information about the Philippine eagle is that the the whole population, since it's critically endangered was really only known to occur down in the southern Philippines. And this, uh, in Davos City down here um, in the southern Philippines is where they were doing a lot of work on, for the conservation of this bird. And it was only recently, in 2011, that they confirmed the Philippine eagle on the northern island of Luzon. So, just a few years, they, and, um, um, and so that there had been some some suspected reports of um, of uh, the Philippine eagle occurring there, but hadn't really been confirmed. And it's extraordinarily um, remote. It's a very um, very tough terrain. Um, and, but in the northern part of Luzon, there's um, there's some um, uh, you know basically intact. Um, uh, forests that um, that have never been affected by um, people, and so um, it's kind of a just a general um, description of, of where I, I went before I go back to the slideshow. Um, so I flew to Manila, and then I flew up to 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 gear to gear out. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank you. I still have it. Took me a while. And um, and then uh, and then from Tagaytay, we drove um, we drove up into uh, so we were in the um, um, uh, uh, province of Apayao, and we we went to the essentially the municipality of Kalanasan, which is up in this area in here. Uh, and this is this is where we were doing our work was in this kind of northern part of Luzon Island, um, 
And there are several villages and small communities kind of within the, the ground of the municipality um, that we visited and that we were working with uh, some of the elders and locals in the community. And then when we were done, we, we drove to Loud City um, and then flew back to Manila. So that's kind of a basic uh, trip uh, uh, kind of place we went, but um, let me go back to the slideshow. Okay, so um, I, I wanted to start with um, kind of a little video. There's two videos, and they're kind of similar, but I wanted um, everyone to be able to see that the first one is kind of like a, more of a promotional video. Um, but before I, before I start this, um, I should, I, I, I didn't mention um, our partner that we were working with, um, and I, I should. So we were, usually when there's a project like this, um, we will be working with um, a local organization, you know, a, kind of a, a local, typically either governmental or non-for-profit organization. So um, in the Philippines, we were working with an organization called the Philippine Eagle Foundation, and, um, you know, the conservation of the Philippine eagle, that is their, that is their mission, that's their goal. Um, a lot of, they have, you know, a staff of professional biologists. A lot of their staff have been, you know, trained in different places. Some of them have worked with Peregrine Fund um, and, uh, and other conservation organizations that have, you know, tremendous capacity um, on uh, kind of rare um, raptor conservation efforts. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that um, that <laughs> I didn't I actually didn't kind of rehearse my my talk, so I kind of failed to mention that at the beginning. But um, working with the Philippine Eagle Foundation, those, that's who when we got to the Philippines, when our team got to the Philippines, who we um, we tied in with and uh, and worked with, and and I wanted to show a little promotional video. Um, that is was developed by the Philippine Eagle Foundation, uh, just to give you a little bit of information about the, the project. So hopefully this will play. Most of us have never ventured into the mountains of our beautiful country. Few know that our remaining forests contain some of the greatest diversity of life found anywhere on the planet. But widespread deforestation has harmed the creatures that inhabit our forests. And now, one of nature's finest creations will disappear forever. At the Philippine Eagle Foundation, we are driven by a single purpose. To save the great Philippine Eagle. With a network of collaborators, we're working to secure the future of the entire species. Our scientists monitor wild eagles to understand where they live and breed. Our captive breeding program raises eagle chicks for introduction into the wild. And our community organizers work with communities to ensure that eagles and people peacefully coexist. With these efforts, we believe that one day, the eagle will be cherished and not harmed. And that our nation's connection to the forest will be restored. By protecting the Philippine eagle, we save more than a single endangered species. We preserve our precious forests. We secure the livelihood of our people. And we protect our nation's future. We invite you to join us in this effort. So that, that's just kind of a short, um, a short kind of a promotional video that the Philippine Eagle Foundation put together. They have a second one. It's a little bit longer. Um, they they provided copies. Um, I've got. Um, let's see, this is the uh, this is a slightly longer version that I also wanted to show. There's a little bit of duplication between the two, but this one. 
uh, provides a little bit more detail that I wanted to share also. Most of us have never ventured into the mountain forests of our beautiful country. But there are those who spend months at a time navigating this challenging environment. These individuals are driven by a single purpose. To save the great Philippine eagle. These biologists serve the Philippine Eagle Foundation and they are on their way to release one of the rarest animals on Earth back into the wild. They call him Matatai. Although few of us have seen a Philippine eagle in the wild, its image is familiar to us. The eagle is embedded in our stories and in our culture. It is one of our most powerful national symbols. But the status of the eagle is also an urgent reminder of our strained relationship with nature. We have seen the loss of the forests around us, and there have been consequences for both people and eagles alike. In the early 1960s, renowned biologist, Professor Dioscoro Rabor, was the first to study the great eagle. He was also the first to sound the alarm that the fragmenting of our forests was taking a tragic toll on the species. Today, the forests have dwindled even further, and the eagle's population has plummeted from thousands to just several hundred individuals. Every remaining eagle is precious. The death of one can have a serious impact on the population as a whole. Matatag was brought to the foundation critically wounded, a survivor of a near-fatal gunshot injury. Like many eagles, Matatag was shot while searching for food in nearby farmlands. With the loss of forests and the prey they provided, the eagles have been forced into the open and into new conflicts. <coughs> Since the 1970s, the Foundation has cared for dozens of injured birds. But securing the future of an entire species requires a bigger investment. It takes tracking the movement of eagles to understand and protect where they nest and forage. Raising eagle chicks for reintroduction into the wild. working with communities to ensure that eagles and people peacefully coexist. Matatag is one of the many eagles fortunate enough to return home. However, the hope is that one day such releases will become unnecessary that our eagles will be cherished and not harmed, and our connection to them restored. By protecting the Philippine eagle, we are saving our forests. And by saving our forests, we will secure our own livelihood and our nation's future. Okay, I know there was a little bit of duplication between those, but I wanted to show them both because I, they both have a few different elements. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, when we went to the map, so uh, we were in the kind of um, northern part of Papa Ayao province in the municipality of Kalanasan, 
And uh, we were kind of near the village of um, uh, uh, Eva Puzon, um, which is kind of up in this area here, um, right up here. And the forests that we were working on were down in here. And so on this map, this pink area is the um, municipality. And, um, and these white areas are the potential communal forests. Those are the areas that they're wanting to set up for the local, kind of for sustainable management from the locals. And these are, these are all like native, essentially unmanaged forests other than the fact that, you know, people have been living on the landscape for a long time, but they don't, they haven't been commercially logged. Um, but what, what, how, what they're trying to do in the whole province and in Kalanasan in particular is they're trying to um, uh, uh, designate this entire area and all of the uh, forests around here as a biosphere reserve. Um, but part of the goal is to make sure that they have some forest lands that can be sustainably managed where people can get their wood resources, but that it can be done in a way um, that also is sustainable. Um, and one thing uh, that was um, pretty fascinating is, um, you know, this was, this was, uh, um, um, you know, one of the, the things about Apa Ayao was that the, uh, the whole province, you know, has a real strong conservation emphasis, like the, 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 uh, the governor who um, we had an opportunity to meet with when we first arrived um, um, in the provincial capital. Um, his family um, has, um, the reason that these forests have not been logged is because of his family and their um, desire and recognition of the conservation value of these forests. And so they're actually working, you know, very um, uh, strategically to try to not only conserve the forests and manage for subsistence uses, but also kind of develop this as kind of an ecotourism area and um, look at some alternative ways of bringing in income and resources to the uh, communities, different um, opportunities. And one of, the, one of the things that was, you know, quite an incredible infrastructure project that was happening while we were there is there's a, like a major you know, paved um, highway or road um, over some tremendously difficult terrain that went, you know, through um, the province of, or through the uh, um, municipality of Kalanasan and connected over to Laog City and uh, over the mountain pass. And I mean, it's a, a tremendous effort. And, um, and so, you know, as they kind of work on developing the infrastructure, part of their goal is to also um, have like forest conservation plans in effect, have um, potential before they bring in and start marketing tourism, or before they, you know, they don't want to like, um, they want to make sure that they get, can get their arms around it before they open the doors because it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, just incredibly beautiful to see these um, wild forests up here. So um, when we first got to the um, to Apa Ayao province, we went to, like I mentioned, we met with the governor and um, uh, his staff, as well as the Department of Natural Resources. And, you know, when we went into the, um, to the uh, Capitol building, you know, they, uh, we were greeted uh, kind of with a traditional uh, uh, dance. Um, you know, our, I forgot to mention the, the staff that I was traveling with. So there were several Forest Service people, myself, um, another individual from Colorado. Uh, his name is Ed Beery, and he's a GIS expert. They brought him there because he's both, uh, um, he was going to work with the uh, uh, Philippine Eagle Foundation GIS folks, and as well as he's a forester. Um, we also were traveling with our um, contact with the um, uh, Phil, with the international programs. Um, uh, Elizabeth um, LeBeau and um, and also uh, this other 
the prior chief for the Forest Service, Dale Bosworth, was with us as well. He's retired now, but uh, he uh, was traveling with us, and he has been doing a lot of volunteer work for international programs, essentially kind of as a, a conservation diplomat. And so, um, uh, anyway, we were welcomed in uh, to the um, Capitol. We met with the governor, um, had a tremendous dinner that they served for us, uh, and I, I really enjoyed I, I personally had taken pictures of all of the wonderful food that was served, but as I shared with some folks before the meeting started, um, uh, my phone, which had all my pictures on it, got erased, and so I lost all my pictures, and so all of these pictures I borrowed from other people on the trip. I don't have any of my own anymore. Um, but this is just a, this is actually a, a, a little video. So th these are two places. This is with the, at the Capitol when we met the governor, and then this was in Eva Pazon when we met with the uh, at the local field station for the um, for the uh, Philippine Eagle Foundation and where they were based out of their their field. And this is just uh, a little video clip, a partial video clip. So up here they were doing the um, kind of this welcome dance ceremony. And we, they did the same thing when we got to um, Eva Pazone, but you know, this is me here where I was asked to participate in that, so I thought I'd show a little. <laughs> participated there, kind of went in there, and were invited to um, participate in this kind of welcome dance. So, so I, I have just a wanna... question. Yeah. Is there a better video that I can actually see you dance instead of, like, why is that skipping? <laughs> you know, oh, so that. I haven't seen that. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, we can do it later, but I just, I want to see your moves. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had taken a lot more video, and you know, I really, I had taken some video of, of uh, well, anyway, I, I lost all my pictures, so I'm going to, I do have some, I haven't recovered it. Um, Kate uh, helped help me, like, sort through some of these. Um, so this is where we spent a lot of our time, let me check my time, oh, I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. Um, this is where we had spent a lot of our time, so this was their field office, and uh, this was some of the some of the team that we met. This is um, Bill Bosworth, the former chief of the Forest Service. This is Jason, um, uh, uh, one of the main leaders for the Philippine Eagle Foundation, um, and some of their other biologists, um, members from the Department of Natural Resources, um, and then also that worked out there were a lot of Forest Green Guards, and these guys. Um, they're essentially like uh, patrolling the forest. These guys are all locals from the community. They, they live in the local community. They, they probably uh, may have um, previously, you know, trapped and set snares in the forest, but now they've been hired through grants that the Forest Service provides to the, through, to the Philippine Eagle Foundation. They've been hired by the Philippine Eagle Foundation. And these guys patrol the forests. They've been taking down some of the snares and traps that were set for some of the uh, wild animals. There's like some endangered deer and different things in the forest there. Um, and, and a lot of these locals, a lot of these guys, uh, when they took us on these hikes, I mean, these guys know this forest. I mean, this is like their ancestral land. And, uh, you know, I couldn't believe like the paths that they found through some of the jungle for us to, to, to get into um, some of the remote areas. But um, uh, there was about uh, 14 of the, of the guys that, um, that were the forest guards. And they helped with the data collection for the communal forest inventory as well as patrolling um, the forests and, and uh, uh, helping with the data, with looking for the Philippine Eagle or protecting it, guarding the locations. So some of um, what we did was 
you know, sitting down, kind of, you know, uh, collaborating with our team on the site um, and uh, working with them kind of on the inventory management approaches. We would kind of strategize on like where we're going to go and how we would uh, uh, tackle this kind of idea of inventory in the forest. The Department of Natural Resources was actually wanting 100% inventory of the forest. In other words, they wanted every tree mapped and measured, species. I mean, it was it was an impossible task, you know, um, and we shared that with them in our report. Not, not only was it impossible, it was kind of unnecessary, um, but, you know, we, uh, um, we helped, you know, train some of the forest guards on some of the forest measurement sampling approaches. Um, one thing to note on the uh, on this picture, you can see this kind of V-shaped area. This is what they call like a, a slash and burn area where the, this, you know, they basically, uh, the locals would light this on fire and the fire would kind of run up the hill and then they would plant that with crops, you know, maybe rice or or different um, uh, uh, food that they that they were um, using. So, you know, one thing, you know, that you know, there is obviously kind of a challenge in balancing conservation is recognizing that people need to survive and they need to to live off these lands, whether that's growing their own food or um, needing some resources. But there was a lot of a lot of challenges like um, I, that I learned about. Like they weren't allowed to to cut the trees, there was like laws against it. And so, um, but they were allowed to burn the trees, uh, but they couldn't, they couldn't use the, uh, you know, they could burn them for agriculture, but they couldn't just go cut them down for logs. Um, and so that was part of the goal of, um, you know, trying to come up with a management plan for the forest was to come up with a way to, um, uh, for sustainable harvest out on the landscape. You know, part of when we're sitting here in this meeting, part of what we were doing is we were looking at the uh, at like a GIS, and we would take this forest and we would we would break it into smaller stands where we would you know we might part of these lines were slopes and part of these were municipal boundaries, and you can see here's a road, but there was also rivers, and um, this was that one road that was um, was developed that kind of new road and so we were trying to figure out how we would take this big landscape this that we were trying to do this 100 percent inventory on the forest and uh, break it compartmentalize it into areas that um, that can be inventory and so we, we ended up developing kind of a sampling strategy where you know they would do um, uh, we, we came up with a kind of a, a sampling strategy where this whole uh, I don't want to explain the whole thing, but basically the, the samples would be distributed within each of these um, areas where they would go to, to certain points, where we would go to certain points on the ground and collect information. So we'd get out to the forest, you know, and the one thing that really struck me is we, when we got out there, is this was an incredibly diverse and incredibly difficult terrain. Um, to, uh, to, to, to work in. I mean, some of the slopes were extraordinarily steep. The vegetation was extraordinarily dense. You know, um, some of the trees that you would see here, you can see these are giant, like, fern, um, like, like, tar tar um, like, tar tar forests. And, uh, uh, you know, it was extraordinarily difficult to, like, do some traditional forestry management where you might, like, try to measure the tree and see the height, you know, and some of the tools and techniques that we would do where you would take, uh, there's a tool called a clonometer that you would use. I mean, you couldn't see the tops of these trees because the vegetation was so, so thick. Um, and there was also like this unbelievable um, tree diversity that was going on out there. And so part of our goal was to identify the trees. Um, and that's where the green guards, the locals really were absolutely uh, essential because they knew the tree species. Um, one thing that we quickly discovered that was that in addition to the Philippine eagle, um, there's a lot of endangered hardwoods, there's a lot of other endangered plants and animals in these forests. 
and uh, and there's also a lot of sacred sites, you know, traditional sites that uh, were protected by um, uh, the village elders that uh, they maybe didn't want anybody going into. Um, and so all of that had to be taken into consideration uh, when we were trying to help them with the inventory purchase. You showed some images earlier of some of the primates, including the little tarsiers. Yeah. Do they, the tarsiers live in this area? They, they, they apparently do. I didn't actually see any. You know, it was kind of striking when we were in the forest. Yeah. We didn't, um, we didn't actually see a lot of animals, you know. Um, it was kind of strikingly quiet, you know, and I've been to some other jungle areas where, you know, uh, so the context, I was really kind of stunned, actually, how quiet some of the forests were. And I don't know if it was just maybe they're more nocturnal or um, but, but it was also incredibly difficult to kind of get a gauge because these forests were so dense, so tall, um, that if they were in a canopy, you might not ever know. Yeah, we saw a ton of tarsiers at the hall. Yeah, that preserve there, oh. and and they would um, sit on branches very low to the ground. Oh. Um, but but they're you know they're tiny and yeah. they're hard to spot. You you see their big eyes before you see it. Yeah, you know we didn't hardly see any mammals or reptiles. I mean we did see some of the rare deer, the small. When they make our black-tailed deer look giant, you know, these are <laughs> little small deer. And of course my pictures are all disappeared, so I didn't find any. Um, one of the things I mentioned is they had found an active nest of the Philippine Eagle in northern Luzon Island, and after years of work, they managed to um, track down the nest, capture a chick, um, put a radio transmitter on it, and um, and so part of what we did also while we were there is we we went out to the site where this chick was, and you know they did a little bit of radio telemetry, check, check it on it, making sure the chick was still in the area. Uh, this is Dale Bosworth, this is our former chief of the Forest Service. He was uh, checking out the, the nesting area. I'm gonna throw in a picture of the chief. This area here is, um, is one of the agriculture areas. You can see this area down here has recently been burned. And this area, kind of on the other side of that ridge is where the, um, the nesting Philippine Eagle is. And the local family that lived here, you know, they um, uh, they were great. You know, they know that the eagles there, and they they're working to protect it. They 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 found great pride in knowing that the eagle was um, was uh, near the forest where they lived, and uh, and they worked really closely with the um, with the local members of the Philippine Eagle Foundation to make sure that it was protected and allowed access, you know, kind of through some of their agricultural and by their home to, uh, to get access to this. But, um, you know, obviously, you know, they need to um, have access to these resources so that they can feed themselves. Um, yeah, this is kind of an example of, you know, we, we would sit in the room and come up with a GIS exercise about where we would go do our sampling. And we'd get out to the field and it'd be like this incredibly steep landscape. And we're like, how are we going to approach this? Um, and so uh, it, it, I, uh, I was thoroughly impressed by um, the field, by the ability of, of the, the green guards um, to navigate this landscape. I mean, it was incredibly difficult terrain. Um, and we have some steep ground around here. And, in uh, the Cordova area of the Chugach National Forest, but this was very, very steep ground. Um, and they did a great job of getting up there and navigating the landscape. This is kind of another picture um, of us getting up there. I should point out myself, so I'm, I'm standing here. You can see my extra tufts. <laughs> yeah, here I am going into the forest. There's my extra tufts, <laughs> heading up to uh, take the tree measurements. You can see how getting the camp or the tree height would be difficult in a, in a place like this. Um, there's also a lot of stream crossings involved in getting across some of this uh, some of this country. Um, and uh, you know, we, one of the other things that we did is we would um, 
uh, visit some. This is uh, right here. This is um, actually rice that's drying on um, on the on the cement. There was a while we were there. It was the end of May, early June, and there was a lot of rice harvest going on. And folks were taking advantage of the cement to make sure they laid their rice out for drying. But we we also went to some of the communities and. Um, had some several public meetings where we'd meet with the village elders and we'd ask um, uh, input on the kind of idea of the communal forest and you know where uh, you know their kind of input on the kind of the idea of trying to manage some of that for wood resources and um, as well as seeking input from them on uh, on you know areas that maybe should be excluded, like if there's a, um, a sacred site or some something that was important to the community where they didn't want to see logging uh, or um, personal use logging, not commercial logging, uh, that they should make it, make the team aware of. So uh, we, we, would, we visited uh, several of the local uh, communities in that process to, um, to uh, to gather kind of some of the information while we're there. I think I already showed that picture. That's us meeting in the community. Um, this is just kind of another photograph of one of the rivers there. I, I mean, I know that uh, the probably the the one thing that was so striking, you know, is you know, as we traveled from. Kalan Asan, Kalau City, is when we went over the mountain pass, you know, over near Kalau City, you know, the mountains were very different. Like all the forests had been, had been cut. I mean, all the way up to the top of the mountain. And, um, and the rivers were not clear like this. I mean, you can see how absolutely crystal clear this water is and, um, and cool for being in the Philippines. I mean, relatively cool water and you know, fish in the water, and um, and so, you know, I think that was kind of one thing that, that our team kind of was really left with was that, um, that you know, there that certainly there's a conservation need for the Philippine eagle, um, but it's so much bigger than just the Philippine eagle, and the Philippine eagle is really, um, it's kind of a, um, a flagship or an umbrella species that you know, if, if the country and the province can be successful in conserving this, this eagle, then they're also going to be successful in conserving, you know, the natural resources for the community. They'll be um, successful in, in, in conserving tremendous other variety of endangered plants and animals and conserving, um, you know, these tremendous resources like clear, cool water that's that uh, um, that the communities use for for drinking and and uh, their resources. Um, so as the uh, you know some of the what what we ended up doing kind of as a product of any of these trips that we go on is the Forest Service always comes up with a trip report, which is essentially a series of recommendations that we provide to our partner that says here's some recommendations for the your next steps that you know you might consider. And, um, and really what we ended up coming up with was um, uh, kind of a strategy for not only a management plan for, um, for like, you know, sustainably harvesting some wood for the locals, that, that's, that's easy to think about. But really, some of the other things that we do around here where we manage for recreation, or we manage for outfitter and guides, or we manage for tourism, I mean, the, the resources that and the opportunity for the people at this uh, Kalanasan to get a livelihood isn't in cutting and selling the timber. It's really in a sharing the experience of the beauty of this landscape with visitors, whether that be um, you know you know residents of the Philippines or international visitors that visit the area. Um, and so that was part of what we. We share as well as outlining the process for completing an actual inventory of the landscape.
Um, so right now, how do people survive from this little splash and burn? Put, put in little gardens? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, all, all of the local villages, you know, I mean, they grow their own food. They've got, you know, rice paddies. They plant their crops. They, they dry their rice. And, um, you know, they raise... They raise their food, and that's. I mean, they 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 grow their own food and survive off the off the agricultural abilities. I mean, a lot of them it's like direct agriculture. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly there's um, uh, you know some stores, but I mean it's uh, it you know if there's it's not like people have a, a lot of access to to. Um, cash to go buy food, you know, they have to grow their own food. And do they keep livestock? Do they have pigs? You know, we saw, um, we saw some cattle and there, were, there was some livestock and there are some wild pigs in the forest also that, um, that they will trap and, and eat. And, but the, the, uh, the governor has actually made a very hard, I, I almost think, I, I frame it as hard, but he's, he said, you know, there'll be no trapping or no harvest of these wild animals from the forest. And so I actually think that they're probably, the forest probably could support harvest of some of the pigs because the pigs will come out of the forest and get into the rice. And a lot of them do get killed, but, you know, they're kind of being killed uh, in violation of what the governor is wanting. And so it kind of puts the people, the residents, in kind of a difficult situation where they're trying to protect the crops. With you know, so that's it's really not an indigenous thing. It's, it's, no, I think it is. It's not Isn't that the one that I can see here? No, it's it's a it's a native wild pig. Okay. Um, but uh, um, but there there was some livestock resources, but most of it was agriculture. Um, any other questions? I, I mean, this is kind of, I know I'm a little bit late, and we started a little late, but uh, I wanted to show a couple of other slides. This is information on the Philippine Eagle Foundation. It's just a pretty simple uh, website, philippineaglefoundation.org, if anyone's interested in <coughs> checking out their website or learning more about the Philippine Eagle, um, you can go to that one. But are there any questions for me on the... Sure. Yes. Did you uh, learn anything about the habitat types that might be limiting, or like nesting habitat, or foraging, oh, or? Yeah, you know, um, it was interesting. Like the 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 emphasis was when I went down there. The emphasis was kind of on um, the conservation of the Philippine eagle, but the the project that we really worked on was really helping them with inventory approaches to their forest, like helping them kind of come up with a management plan. So even though we knew we were in an area where the, where the eagles were, um, we didn't, they weren't, we weren't like down to like brass tacks doing wildlife biology work for eagles and figuring out like what might be limiting them. I think, I think, um, I think kind of the, uh, the basic piece of information is that they know that the main thing that's limiting them is, you know, these intact, old, mature forests. Mm -hmm. And in most of um, Luzon Island, there aren't forests anymore. It's all been uh, harvested or burned. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you've got whole mountains that look like grasslands. And so, really, the what is limiting the Philippine eagles is um, not anything other than lack of forest. And that's why the whole entire strategy for Kalanasan is just to designate it as a biosphere reserve and come up with these few communal forests that are emphasized for management where people could go for the resources but leave the rest of it alone, you know, basically set it aside as a, as a preservation area. Sir? Um, are there panthers there? No, there aren't. One of the pictures, they just look, there's something that looks like a cat. But... Yeah, yeah, I think so. How many of the eagles are known to live in Afayo province? You know, um, they only know the one nest site they confirmed, but there's a couple of other reported areas that the team is, is trying to, they've got some really good um, leads on some other nest sites. But they only know of the one nest site. But certainly, 
I mean, you know, if it's on the far northern part of the Philippines, with you know, they, um, they you know, they suspect that there's a pop, you know, obviously a um, some kind of a small population there, but they have no idea how many eagles are up there um, on the on the Luzon Island on the northern part there. So um, they're in the process of trying to do that uh, survey, and kind of what they're doing, their their strategy is really just kind of talking with community and hearing from like uh, a local person that says, oh, I think I saw one of those. And, and then they, you know, they try to validate that report and then they send their, their biologists out there across some incredibly difficult terrain to try to track it down and find it. Um, but a lot of these forests are, I mean, uh, so wild that it's just, you know, it might take them four or five or six days to access like the site where, you know, with no roads, I mean, just tremendously difficult terrain to kind of get to some of the areas where these uh, birds are reported just because of the terrain. Yeah. Uh, how much radio tracking is, are they using? <coughs> how much? Yeah. Um, well, they've only got, uh, up in Luzon Island, they've only got the one bird that has the, the radio on it. But down in... Um, the southern part of the Philippines, where they're raising birds and releasing them into the wild, um, they uh, um, they they they've got all of those birds marked. So down south, but I don't know the total number of birds that they have marked. So, any questions? Yeah. Okay. You know, as far as like the kind of next steps, we're actually hoping that. One of the things that um, that the other uh, aspects of the Forest Service is, or the international programs, is occasionally we invite um, other folks from. You know, not only do we go to the other countries, but we also invite um, 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 other folks back to the U.S. to to learn from us. And like right now, the Cordova District is hosting a uh, in, through the international programs a um, a. Um, a forestry intern from Spain, his name is uh, Jose, and he's here for the next few months learning about forestry. And um, one of our recommendations for this report was to send some of the staff from um, some of the Green Guards back to the U.S. to learn. I mean, we were there for just a couple of weeks, and, and you know, you can only train so much in that amount of time. So one of our recommendations is to send some of their employees back to the U.S. to work with Forest Service staff, maybe in Puerto Rico or the southern Florida, on one of the national forests that are kind of more aligned with tropical forestry, and train them a little bit on, on some more, you know, really detailed, some of the forest inventory and management approaches. So there's some, you know, continued collaborations going on with that. But with that, that's all I have. So thank you very much. Sorry, I ran a little long. Thank you. Thank you so much.